Hi there, hope you're doing fantastic today. I had the pleasure just a few minutes ago to talk to Ellen Wormter, a sleep nurse practitioner who I connected with on Twitter. It is the first time we're speaking and it is remarkable how much we've independent of each other reached the same conclusions when it comes to insomnia. I think you'll get a lot of value from this episode. Enjoy. So with us today, we have Ellen Wormter. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, Ellen. Thanks for having me. Really cool having you on. And, and um, for everyone out there, Ellen is a nurse practitioner practicing sleep medicine in, in Charleston, right? Charlottesville. Oh, Charlottesville. Sorry, North Carolina. <laughs> Virginia. Oh, my gosh. I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. well, thanks again for coming on. And um, me, me and Ellen, we, we connected on, on, on Twitter. We've connected a few times. But, but yeah, just, just, tell, just tell us, um, how did you get into like sleep and insomnia, Ellen? Well, um, I'm practicing in a sleep medicine clinic. So I see a variety of patients, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, restless legs. And of course, people also come to us for problems with falling asleep and staying asleep. So I learned pretty quickly that there aren't a lot of CBTI providers in this area, and it really is the best treatment for chronic insomnia. And so I went ahead and got certified and have been providing that for my patients here at the clinic. Very cool. And so, so like, so you started practicing in sleep, noticed there was a lot of insomnia, there wasn't really much help for them. And that's how you got into, uh, to reading, to learning CBTI? Yes. Mm-hmm. Cool. And, and what made you go into sleep from the, from the beginning? Oh, that, that was just, you know, good luck. I mean, I, I, I came out of NP school thinking I was going to do primary care and got a few offers in primary care and but I also got an offer at a, at this clinic and really thought it was a an interesting specialty and I'm really glad that I I decided to to take this job because it's been uh, it's just been a wonderful learning experience and it's something that everybody can relate to because everybody does it about a third of their day and um, and you really feel like you're making a difference so I've en- I've enjoyed it and plan to stay here Sounds sounds great. I think it sounds very similar to my experience. Like, I feel you help a lot of people, but at the same time, there's no emergencies really. It's like a good lifestyle as well, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. And I'm I'm a busy mom of four, have a lot of other wow. things going on. So to be able to kind of leave at the end of the day and not have that call has been very helpful for work life balance. I hear you. Okay, very cool. So uh, as I alluded to just before we, you know, we started recording here, I was going to ask you, so, you know, if you could pick one thing that you think is important that maybe is a little bit overlooked, what would you pick as like, what is your insomnia insight? Oh, I, do I really have to pick one? It's so hard. I, I debated this because I kind of went back and forth between the mental pause. That's what, what I call it. A lot of people will call it the worry window and the other one, which I think I'm going to go with the other one. But the, the maybe we can talk about the, the mental pause at another Absolutely. on another one. But I think that that one is better suited for people who are kind of just getting started with insomnia. And the one I'm going to talk about today is more for people who have embraced their insomnia identity. They are just really in the depths of it. And basically what that insight is, is that there needs to be something bigger in your life than your battle with sleep. Um, when, when so usually with insomnia, it starts out with some sort of event that sort of precipitated the, this process. And then it becomes sort of a panic, like, oh, no, I didn't sleep. And what if I don't sleep tomorrow? And then it builds and it builds and it builds and until it becomes this huge problem. And maybe that precipitate, precipitating event has come and gone. But now what's driving that hyper arousal is this 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 insomnia giant that has you know sprung up and if you look on twitter and you look under hashtag insomnia people will often refer to it as a battle yeah and it's because they've kind of 
you know, they've, they've, the insomnia has become such a big part of their, their life that it's consuming everything else. It's the first thing they think about in the morning. They think about it 20, 30 times a day. And, and it is now the lion at the mouth of the cave. It is now the thing that, you know, is driving a lot of this hyper arousal that's keeping them from resting at, at night. The good news is that you don't have to participate in that battle. And one of the, one of there's two ways you can do that. One is you need to shrink the dryant, and the other is that you need to find something else that, you know, you need to live a, a full engaging life so that all of your time and energy is not focused on your sleep. Um, do you, what do you think about that thought? A hundred percent agree with everything you said. And uh, it, it's so funny talking to you how like I, I've come up with like almost exact same an, 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 analog, what I'm saying, like analogies, analogies, metaphors. Yeah. But in my mind, I think of it like, uh, you know, it's kind of a monster and you have to starve it instead of feed it. And I yes. talk a lot about like yes. patients, right? Absolutely. That's I'll say that all the time. Like you're feeding the giant, you, you know, you're just the more attention that you give it, the more power you're giving it over your life. And, you know, one of the things I use with parenting is, you know, how kids are when they're little is that they want to annoy each other. So they do things to push each other's buttons and they'll just, you know, you know, uh, uh. and you know, and you say as a parent, you say, why are you letting your brother get to you? Stop it. You know, just ignore him. And so I would tell my kids, you see this little freckle on your wrist? That's your ignore button. Anytime he does that to you, you push your ignore button and you keep pushing it <laughs> to remind yourself that unless you engage with the, him, you know, if you don't engage with them, it's going to go away. Right. And so we tell this to kids all the time. But yet when it comes to sleep, we can't, you know, ignore it. Instead, we just keep feeding it and letting it grow and that type of thing. So well, instead, we need to do that whole, I don't know if you're familiar, this other parenting strategy called the get along shirt, where when they're fighting, you you put one t-shirt, one giant t-shirt on both of them, uh -huh. and you force them to kind of like spend time with each other. And uh, so you have to learn to sort of not embrace your insomnia, but you have to look at it instead of as this big battle, this big fight, as from time to time, everybody has a night where they don't sleep. And the more attention that we give that night, the the, the harder it's going to be to kind of get past it. Absolutely. And, and, and taking that analogy with like the giant t-shirt uh, on both of the kids, how would you like translate that into your battle with insomnia? Well, one of the things that and this is a hard place to get to. So this is a tricky, a tricky piece that comes up for me all the time in clinical practice because people will say, what do I do if I wake up and I can't go back to sleep? Well, of course, if you go by sort of standard CBTI principles, if you are awake and aware of it and you're frustrated, you want to leave the bed so that you don't build the bed as this cue, as this place where you struggle. You don't want it to be a cue for wakefulness and frustration and things like that. Um, and I think that that's true in the beginning stages, but at some point it should sort of, you know, drift over into this place where if you wake up and you're awake, you, and you know it, you should be able to get to a point where you tell yourself, I'm awake, I'm in a dark place, it's cool, it's quiet, I'm comfortable, and I'm not asleep. What's the big deal? I'm getting some rest. I'm getting some relaxation. I'm getting benefit from that rest and relaxation. Even if I'm not sleeping, you're getting some benefit from that. And if you can stay not frustrated and you can think about some nice things like what to plant in your garden or where you want to go on vacation or, you know, something that's sort of pleasing and pleasant for you, then you know, there's nothing wrong with being in bed. And that's the kind of get along. That's the sort of you know, if it's not, if you don't care that you're not asleep, then it's not a problem. Exactly. Yeah. And I totally get that. Uh, let me ask you this. Have you, is this something you kind of like you figured out by practicing or something like you, you read about? Oh, I, I've read a lot, a lot. There's so many good resources. And unfortunately, I think people with insomnia are sort of driven to the wrong things to read. I think they're driven to all of the, not the scare tactics, but all of the, the 
the things in the media that say, oh my gosh, we have to get our eight hours or all these horrible things are going to happen to you. And those are the messages that they are receiving and processing and internalizing. And they're the exact wrong ones they, that they need to see. They need to see the other ones that say, you know what, if you try to sleep outside of your potential, you're going to have, you're not you're just not going to meet that. So you need to stop worrying about some magic number and sleep according to what makes, what makes you feel better the next day. hundred percent. You know, it's, it's amazing. I had, uh, do you know, Nick Wignall, he's on Twitter. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's totally fine. I, 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 he's not very, very active there, but I, I, I talked to him like maybe two weeks ago and it's just the same experience as talking with you. It's just so amazing. It's like, Oh, oh my gosh! There's there's another people out there who's thinking just like I'm thinking. You know, I don't know how you Absolutely. feel about it, but do you feel? I just feel like you know people like yourself and myself and Nick and so we're kind of like just these isolated people sitting here and there. Or, or do you feel like you're connected with other people that that think the same way you do? Yes, um, and my sleep colleague here in the clinic does, which is awesome. So that's, that's been a nice. great resource. But I, I can see where it would be kind of isolating because. You know, the message out, it, but particularly if you're working with patients like this a lot, you you have to you have to understand these things uh, and they seem so, uh, so easy to understand. And yet the message that that we get in the media still continues to be, you know, that you've got to get your eight hours or the, the world's exactly. going to end. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't. Yeah. Going in a kind of different direction here, uh, you know. What are your thoughts on that? Like, how how can that? Because I spend a lot of time thinking about like how can that message be changed, and uh, and, and I have a few thoughts on that. But do you have thoughts on that? Uh, yes, it's it's difficult because I I I will answer a lot of media requests, and when I get when I get those inquiries, I will often put my little blurb in there. Like th these things apply to certain people. There there are two sets of patients that we see. We see the patients who can't, you know, can't sleep. They're having problems with falling asleep or staying asleep. But we see the other side too. There are a lot of people that are not paying attention to their sleep, that they're not, they're depriving themselves of sleep because they're working two jobs. They're staying up till two in the morning. They're streaming Netflix and then they're trying to get up at 6 a.m. in the morning. That's going to long-term be damaging to your health. But that message is for that certain population. The, that message is not for patients with insomnia. Um, and sometimes when I talk to my patients with insomnia and explain that to them, it is a huge relief. Off, yeah, you know, they're yeah, like, exactly. oh, wait, really? That message isn't for me. It's OK. And, and I'm like, yes, it's OK. Guess what's going to happen to you if you, you know, those are that message is for people who aren't giving themselves the opportunity to sleep to what they actually need. Um, whereas insomnia patients are often giving themselves too much of an opportunity. And when they can't meet it, they're, they're having, um, you know, anxiety over that. Ab absolutely. And, uh, you know, speaking of this, the, the magical number out there, I it just, I just want to share something with you and you can comment on it. I, th I had a real, like, uh, aha moment when somebody on my YouTube channel asked me like he, he was like how how often do you see somebody go from sleeping three to seven three to four hours to to seven hours and I was kind of stumped I, I couldn't really answer him and then at, you know processing it I realized that the reason I couldn't answer is that people who kind of overcome their insomnia don't overcome it and say yay now I'm getting eight hours they they overcome it by saying now I'm not afraid anymore now I'm not worried now exactly. it's not so much, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because it's not about the number. <laughs> 100%. It's about the fear and it's about that fear of not sleeping and that and that insomnia has become, you know, it's just become your whole life, the thoughts of it. And then when that when it's not there anymore, when it's shrunk down and it's gone. Exactly. They're not even counting the hours anymore. Exactly. They're just living, they're living their life. They're putting their energies towards something bigger than their battle with sleep. And they're, you know, you know, and, and I think that's, that's kind of key. 100%. Listen, I think we should definitely do another uh, podcast talking about that worry window. I'm so curious about that now. But before I let you go, 
let, let's just touch base on the other thing. Like, I think, you know, when, when we talked about doing this podcast, you told me about some, uh, you know, uh, you had told somebody to write down some positive sleep thoughts. And, and what's your <laughs> practice? Do you usually, yeah, tell me about that. So oftentimes like in the early, in one of the early visits, I'll say one of the things that happens with insomnia is that you'll wake up and you'll have negative sleep thoughts. Uh, you'll have thoughts like, you know, I didn't sleep well last night. I'm going to have a terrible day today and I'm not going to sleep well tonight and all these bad things are going to happen. It, if you had a rough night, it's natural for you to have those thoughts, first of all. Like it's completely normal. And it's because when we have a bad night, our, it's harder for us to control our uh, regulate our emotions mm-hmm. uh, and, and sort of control those thoughts. Uh, so, first of all, you shouldn't be, feel badly for having them, but you need to recognize that that's what it is. It's a it's a negative sleep thought. It's there, and then you need to capture it and you need to replace it with a positive thought. Like, oh no, maybe I didn't sleep well last night, but that doesn't mean it has to affect my day. And in fact, it will probably mean that I'm sleepier tonight and have a greater chance of rebounding and having a better night tonight. So you need to sort of reframe it and. That's that's part of that cognitive training, sort of adjusting expectations, adjusting, you know, those thoughts. And, and so we'll give them a little list of positive sleep thoughts for them to use, to which are all sort of strategies in CBTI um, to replace the negative sleep thoughts. And we want them to pay attention to the fact that they're having them, recognize them and try to replace them with a positive sleep thought instead. Um, so that's, that's often kind of the first step. And I did have a patient who took my list of positive sleep thoughts and wrote a negative thought to (laughs) correspond to each one. And he brought it back to me and he said, I know this is awful. I know how awful I am to have done this, but you have to see what my brain is trying to do. And I said, I understand and it's okay, but let's talk about them some more. And we just went over each one and 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 talked about why he felt that way and and just sort of addressed each one but it's it uh, takes a lot of work on the part of the person doing cbti and i think that that's why sleeping pills are so popular and why people want to turn to them is because it's a quick fix you whip out your prescription pad you write a little script you send your patient on their way they're out the door and you don't have to worry about anymore and on the patient's end oh i have something i have this thing that's going to fix my sleep and that thing is i'm sorry to tell you it is not going to fix your sleep not at all And, and in order for your sleep to get better Better, you're going to have to put some work into it. It's going to take some effort because there's no external thing that's going to make you sleep. It, it needs to happen, you know, from the ground up. Yeah, it is amazing. Like it's it's really really just a pleasure talking to you. Like I, you're just echoing all the thoughts I have myself as well. And I think this has been super super helpful. Um, so uh, uh, any anything you want to add, Ellen? Otherwise, say you know you're. I hope to have you back very soon. No, no, that sounds great. I'd love to come back. We'll talk about the the mental pause and or the worry window um, or, or something else, anything else. There's never a lack of things to talk about when it comes to sleep. I, I know. <laughs> That's the good right. point. Okay, Ellen, take care. All right. Bye, Daniel.